Hi, it's Kate, and this is the fourth video for week one of Math 23. We left off our previous video talking about exactly what happens when linear transformations act on vectors, and we explained computationally exactly how to calculate that result. We have a matrix that represents a linear transformation, we have a vector, and we went through the process of matrix multiplication and figured out exactly how to calculate the resultant vector of a linear transformation acting on a matrix. Let's talk about matrix multiplication more broadly. Well, frequently we'll actually be multiplying matrices together. And you may be wondering why exactly we would be doing that. Let's take a look at this very first example. Say we have our m by n matrix G, and just as we talked about before, that means that it represents a linear function G which maps from Fn to Fm. And say we had some matrix H. It's an n by p matrix. It represents a linear function h that maps from fp to fn. Well, the matrix product gh is defined so that it represents their composition, g composed of h. Basically, h goes first. It takes a vector in fp and spits out a vector in fn. And then g goes second. g takes that vector in fn and then spits out a vector in fm. So the full composition of this function, that's how we write composition of functions, g composed of h, starts with a vector in fp and then ends with a vector in fm after the whole process is complete. All right, well, let's take a look at exactly how this works. We start with some standard basis vector, e sub j. Remember, basis vectors mean that they have a 1 in the jth component and then 0 everywhere else. If we have h act on a vector that looks like this, it will extract the jth column of the matrix big H. Don't believe me? Here's a super simple example. I'm going to pick a random matrix H, it's going to be small, 2 by 2, and then I'm going to multiply it by the first standard basis vector. All right, there they are. Now if I carry out matrix multiplication here, the 1 will only be multiplying the entries in the first column. So we have 1 times 0 plus 0 times 1, so we have 0 there. And then we have 1 times 2 plus 0 times 5, so we have 2 here. And sure enough, when we multiply this matrix right here with the first standard basis vector, it's extracting the first column. Just by the general mechanics of matrix multiplication, this will work any time we multiply a matrix by a standard basis vector. So if we multiply the matrix H by the standard basis vector E sub J, we are extracting the jth column of the matrix H. Our resultant vector is the jth column of the matrix H. So then after H is out of the way, the matrix G now needs to act on it. So the function G will then convert this column to G acting on, this is the jth column of the matrix H, and that tells us the jth column of the final matrix G times H. That's a little bit difficult to picture. Let's take a look at the actual computation that's going on behind the scenes. You may need a fresh piece of paper, but I'm just going to erase the work that I did up here. Here are my two matrices. This one is matrix G. This one is matrix H. And matrix multiplication works much in the same way. I'm going to take this column and this row, this component times this component plus this component times this component, and it will give me the component that should land here. Take a few moments, try this on your own. The second component here will be this column and this row, this component times this component, this component times this component. Take a few moments, put the video on pause in the next moment, I'll reveal the correct answer. All right, there it is. So what we've done is exactly what this paragraph right here describes. We've gone column by column through H and, and then let each column be multiplied by G. So 1, 2, we just look at this column of H and we use matrix multiplication of G onto that column and we get 8, 4. Same thing with 3, 0, we get 6, 12. With 1, 1, we get 5, 4. This is exactly how matrix multiplication works. There are a few important things 
that we really need to take a look at. One is that order matters. What if I had swapped the order of this and tried to multiply H on the left and G on the right? Well, we immediately would have ended up in this problem. I'm just going to write a G up here so we can visualize it. All right, think about what it would be like to multiply H and G together. Already we have a problem because when we go to take the first column of G and multiply it by the matrix H, we don't have the same number as rows in G as the number of columns in H. And that is the only way that matrix multiplication is defined. If we don't have the same number of rows in what's on the right as columns in what's on the left, there is no solution. Matrix multiplication is not possible. So order matters. I'm just going to erase this to avoid confusion. There we go. Order matters a great deal. So that means that maybe you can multiply uh, something G and H together in a particular order, but it does not mean that we can reverse that order. So what do we call that? Right, commutativity. Matrix multiplication is not commutative. Order is a big, big deal. The other thing that's really important is that it is associative. And these are things that you will actually be proving in section this week. All right, very last thing before we take a look at some examples of matrix multiplication is this sigma notation. It's very similar to this piece of sigma notation, but I just want to go over it, make sure that it's clear. Okay, well, first of all, let's take a look at our matrices. We have a G matrix, we have an H matrix, and then we have a C matrix, which in our example up here, this blue one is the C matrix. So that's C. So what this is saying is C sub I comma J. Hmm, what did that mean again? Right. That is the entry that's in the i-th row and the j-th column of this matrix C is the sum of a series of products. Okay, so let's take a look here. We have g sub i comma k and h sub k comma j. That's hard to figure out. We see that the index that's changing is k. All right, i depends on which entry we care about J depends on which entry we care about. So when we look at something like C sub 1 comma 2, that means the entry in the first row and the second column. So we're looking at this sixth one. This means that we're looking at the product of terms that are always in the first row of G and the second column of H, which is exactly what happened here, right? Because I is 1, J is 2, so first row of G, these guys, second column of H, these guys, and the index that is changing is K here. So K is starting at 1 and going to N. In our particular case, we only had 2, right? So K is starting in saying which column of G are you in and which row of H are you in. So the first one is saying, okay, first column, first row of G times first row second column of H plus first row second column of G times second row second column of H. And that will give you that particular component of C. So it's interesting to note that it is telling you that in the product you have row comma column and so of the matrix on the left, you'll be in the same row, and of the matrix on the right that you'll be multiplying, you'll be in the same column. All right, the other thing is, is that some of you may have done matrix multiplication before and have not lined up matrices like this. I really wholeheartedly encourage you to switch to this process. It makes it so much easier, this idea that when you care about a particular row and column component of the product, it is lined up with the row on the left-hand matrix and the column of the above matrix to get, you know, something here. It's really useful to line up your matrices here and here so that the row and the column kind of intersect at this point, which is the component you care about. Okay, let's move on to the next page. Here are some really brief examples of matrix multiplication. You might want to quiz yourself and do them on your own to sort of take a look and see if you get them right. Um, but here we have A 
and B multiplied in the order that gives us AB, and then A again and B again, but now the order is swapped, so we get BA here. Note that, again, we said that matrix multiplication is not commutative, so we are getting two extremely different matrices depending on which order we take the multiplication in. First of all, not only are the numbers different, but the dimensions are different. This is a 2 by 2 matrix. This is a 3 by 3 matrix. And yes, you are absolutely right that every single time, uh, this will have the same number of rows as the left-hand side and the same number of columns as the right-hand side of the product. Unfortunately, there are several typos. There should be a 2 over here, and the negative sign is on the wrong 2 over here. Our sincerest apologies. Make sure you take note of that. All right, we also want to introduce some really important vocabulary in this unit. Here we want to talk about inverse functions for a moment. Uh, a function f, which maps from a set x to a set y, those capital letters generally mean that we are working in a set. A function is invertible if it has the following two properties. It is injective one-to-one. -one. The technical definition of that means that if we have two inputs that have the same function value, so f of x1 is the same as f of x2, then that means that x1 and x2 are equal. That's a really important one. You should definitely highlight that. The other important property is that it is surjective, onto. All right, we have these crazy symbols again. Let's see if we can remember them. This says for all little y in the set big Y. So that means Basically, for all elements that are in the codomain, okay, there exists little x in big X, the set big X. And remember that big X here was our domain. So for all little y, all the elements in the codomain, there exists an element in the domain such that the function value of that element in the domain is equal to that element of the codomain. Again, definitely something to highlight. So in order for a function to be invertible, it needs to have both of those properties. The inverse function we usually notate as g, which you've probably seen f to the negative 1, but it does not mean f to the negative 1. It means inverse function. Essentially has the property that if f of x is equal to y, then g of y is equal to x. So if we started to compose these functions with each other, if we took g composed of f of x, we would just get x back, because we know that f of x is y, and we know that g of y is x, so g composed of f of x is just x, and vice versa if we switched these around. f composed of g of y, well we know g of y is x, and we know f of x is y, so f composed of g of y is y. Note that f composed of g and g composed of f, both take x and return x, or take y and return y, so they are the identity function. Last topic for this video, if we have a matrix A, and it is a 2 by 2 matrix that has these particular values, they can be any numbers, but we said in this component it will be A, B, C, and D. The determinant of this matrix is AD minus BC, and you've probably uh, seen that before. We will get way more into the determinant later in this semester as well as next semester, but it's important to note that even at this early stage, if you fix one column, the determinant is a linear function of the other column. And you guys now know what a linear function is. The other thing that's really important is that if you swap the columns, if instead you wrote matrix A like this, like that, the determinant stays the same in terms of magnitude, but it changes sign, because now we have BC minus AD, which is exactly this, but multiplied by negative 1. That concludes all of the information that is necessary to understand the third R script for week 1 of Math 23.